Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to the afternoon webinar session of today. This is the second of the three lessons about how to create a kinematic protocol with the Smart Analyzer application. So now we are going to start with the second part of the practical session about the Smart Analyzer application. But before starting, I would like to summarize what we did and what you should have already learned during the previous webinar session. In the first lesson, we saw about how to create a new protocol starting from scratch, in particular about how to track a file into the Smart Tracker application to get 3D trajectories, how to create a model for a given set of markers, so how to load a tracker file into the Smart Analyzer, and how to start creating a new protocol panel. Then we talk about the Smart Analyzer layout and its toolbar containing all the available operators. We talk about how to perform 3D marker trajectories interpolation, just in case some gaps are present into the raw 3D trajectories. We saw about how to create virtual markers, as it can be the case of the middle point between two markers, for example. And then you should have learned about how to compute a 1D angle between three markers. We had an example about how to identify local maximum and minimum over a trajectory or an angle. And at last, we had a look about how to save the protocol. Well, during the webinar session of today, we will learn more about some 3D operator. In particular, the objective of today are to learn about how to create a 3D reference system local to a body segment, understanding how to create a 3D vector and about some basic vector operation, how to compute a 3D angles between two body segments, and then we will have a look about how to define a cycle in a movement. We will look about how to normalize a data into the time domain and how to define cycles and a mean cycle. I will show you also how you can apply the same operation to different trials very quickly and how to get the average results from more than one trial. You should remember that during the first lesson we had computed, an, as example, the 1D angle between these three markers to analyze the angle of the elbow during a flexion extension of the elbow task. This 1D angle can give us all information about what happens in the plane defined by these three angles, the, these three markers, sorry. And so we can Read the, read the rotation about the axis that is perpendicular to that plane. But if you want to understand, for example, during a flexion extension task, if you have movement also around other axes, in this case, compute the angle between two vectors is not enough. So, for example, I want to show you this example in the video where the subject is performing a pronosupination task and if you look at the 1D angle that we have computed on the previous time you can see that it can give us the information about the, the rotation of the forearm respect to the upper arm. The 1D angle is only able to read only a small amount of rotation respect to what is real. You can see that we have, for example, in this example, just uh, almost 20 degrees of peak to peak of uh, degree. Uh, but it, this is not correct because uh, the, the range of motion of the pronosupination task is higher back to this value. So this is just to let you understand that if you want to measure that rotation, that type of rotation, you cannot measure by mean of a 1D angle, and so by mean of just two vectors defined by these three markers. But you, you need to define a 3D reference system, one 
local to the distal and one local to the proximal segment. And then you have to compute the 3D angle between these two segments. So now you are going to learn how to create a 3D reference system. But before, I would like also to clarify some basic concepts about the body segment 3D kinematics. We can say that the definition of a 3D local reference system is the basis of the 3D kinematics evaluation of a body segment. The first important key point to remember is that to define the position and the orientation of a body segment as the one we have uh, in the image, we need to know the position of at least three points belonging to that body. That means that at least three markers has to be placed on the body segment you are going to track for your protocol. As you can see from this example, two points, for example A and B, are useful only to define a direction line, but we need to add a third point C also in order to have this information about the, the information about the body orientation also. So to study about the 3D kinematics of a body segment, it is common to define a reference system composed by three axes that are local on that body. These axes have also to be perpendicular one respect to each other. And they have to define, as much as possible, the functional planes of the movement. This is what normally happens, for, ex uh, for example, with an anatomical protocol approach. For example, imagine you want to define the sagittal, the coronal, and the transversal plane of the movement of the pelvis segment, for example, in order to analyze and measure the rotation around their perpendicular axis that we can call, for example, the pelvic tilt that is around the, the, the rotation around the X red axis, for example, the pelvic obliquity that is around the Z blue axis, and the pelvic rotation that is around the Y green axis. In this case, proper bony landmarks have to be chosen to define this reference system. For example, in this case, we can use the two anterior iliac spines and the sacrum marker for the creation of the 3D reference system definition. Well, just as a quick example, in this case, just to show you that the three points A, B, and D are useful to define a reference system based on X, Y, and Z. That are three perpendicular axes, so they seem to be useful to define a 3D reference system. But this, this is just a technical reference system, and they are not good anatomical axes. So this is just to let you understand that the axis definition is a very important point for the kinematics of the human body. Some other protocols use a more technical approach and use cluster of marker, as you can see, the one defined by the A, B, C, D marker, to define a technical reference system that is local to a segment, in this example to the femur. And then they perform some static calibration with a rigid pointer which contains two markers at a given fixed distance. And they use this calibration to define the position of the real bony landmark, which are useful later to define the anatomical, the real anatomical reference system that is the one uh, drawn in red on the image. In fact, it is not possible sometimes to place the markers on the real bony landmarks in some situation because, for example, uh, relating to due to some pathology or other reason. And this is a, a common approach. On the webinar of today, we are now going to create a very simple model to analyze the 3D kinematics about the upper arm. 
with the same simple marker set used um, during the previous time that you can see um, on this slide. So if you remember, we have used seven markers. Starting by this marker set, we are going to define two different 3D reference systems, local both to the right upper arm and the right forearm. To do that, we have to use three markers that belong to each body segment. And in our simplified model, we are now going to use one marker that is shared between the two segments. That in this case, it would be the mid elbow point. So the first step to create a 3D reference system will be to create the X, Y, and Z axis for both the two segments, as it is shown in the picture. The creation of a reference system with the Smart Analyzer is a very quick operation that can be performed in only a few steps. The second icon available on the upper left side of the toolbar is in fact about the 3D reference system operator. Within this operator, two options are available. The first is about creating a reference system by means of one point and three unit vectors. The second is about creating a reference system with an origin point and other three points. Let's start with the first operator. So in this case, the input required are one point as the origin of the reference system and the other three input will be the three axes, so the X, the Y, and the Z. So, how to define properly the axis required for the 3D reference system in our example? The first axis that we are going to define is the deflection extension axis. We can define this axis as the vector between the medial elbow and the lateral elbow marker. That is the the one uh, the 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 red x axis we have defined in the image then we we need to define the plane between the already defined x axis and the acromion marker we can assume in fact that this is the frontal plane of our body segment to do that we can use the second line, so a second vector in figure between the lateral elbow and the right acromion marker. Then the third axis, Z, will be perpendicular to the defined coronal plane. And again, because we need three perpendicular axes, the reference system definition requires that the Y axis has to be the cross product between the already defined X and Z. And so you can see the results of the y-axis. So now we can perform exactly the same steps with our Smart Analyzer application. So this is the protocol that we started during the first lesson, and that is the marker set used. So this is the 3D workspace, and remember that we have loaded the trial tool that has been tracked and loaded into the application. In this trial, the subject is performing a flexion extension of the elbow. And again, just to remember, on the previous time, we have computed these two virtual markers, which can represent the joint center of the elbow, this one, and the one of the wrist. And then we have created a 1D angle um, between the three markers that are the right acromion, the medial elbow, and the medial wrist. Okay, so that was the 1D angle that we have computed. But as I have told you before, by mean of two vectors, we can only measure the angle in a plane. 
but if we want to get information also about what happens in other planes, we have to define a 3D reference system. So this is what we are now going to start to do. And as you have learned during the presentation, to do this we need to define two reference systems local to both the upper arm segment and the forearm. Okay, so before creating the reference system, we need to define the three X, Y, and Z axis. To do that, we can use the 3D vector operator that is the first available into the Smart Analyzer toolbar. So we can select it and we can choose the option to define a point-to-point -point unit vector. Okay. So the output is going to be the upper arm X axis. And now we need to input. The first will be the origin of the vector. So in this case, I want to choose the lateral elbow. And the second is going to be the medial elbow. Because I want to define, remember that I need to define the axis between which define the flexion extension axis of the elbow. That will be from the lateral to the medial marker. So I can now also show you the results into the 3D workspace. So this is the vector that we have just created. So now we need to define the coral plane. So we have to define the line which define with the x-axis the plane respect to which the z-axis will be perpendicular. So we can define the second line again by means of a second vector. So we can choose the same option as before. The output now is the second line of the upper arm. So Okay. okay, so in this case, the first input is the lateral elbow, and the second is going to be the right acromion, for example. So this is the second line. Okay, so now we have to define the z-axis that again has to be perpendicular to these planes, to the plane defined by the x and the second line. So to compute the vector that is perpendicular to this um, plane, we can use the normalized cross product operation. So the output will be the upper arm z axis. And the first input is the x and the second, the second line. And so again, I can also show you the result on the 3D workspace. Okay, so as you can see, that Z is perpendicular to the defined plane. So now, at last, we need to define the Y axis that will be perpendicular respect to X and Z. And so again, we can click on 3D vector operator, we can choose the normalized cross product y axis and the first input is going to be the x and the second the z. So now that we have defined, I want to swap so it's better that because I want to get the y from the from the elbow to the acromion, I have to multiply, so to consider as first not the x-axis but the z and then the x as the second. So now the vector that I get will be in the opposite direction. Okay. Okay, so now um, we are ready to define the upper arm reference system. So to do that, 
we can click on this second operator that is the one devoted to the reference system creation. So we can select it and we can choose the point and three unit vector operator. In this case, the, as you can see, we have four input. The first will be, has to be the origin. So for example, we can consider as the origin the, the mid elbow point. Then uh, the other three point has to be the, uh, the three axes, the three just defined axes. So the first, the X, the second, the Y, and the third, the Z. And the name of the output in this case is upper arm reference system. Good. So now I can also visualize the results into the 3D workspace. So I can drag and drop the reference system into the 3D workspace. Good. So now we have to perform the same steps also for the Fourier reference system. So let's start again with the axis definition. So I can click on 3D vector. I can select the point-to-point -point unit vector. The first axis that I want to define is the Fourier arm X axis. Okay, and I'm going to use uh, the lateral and the medial wrist marker. So the first input is I want to choose is the lateral wrist that will be the origin of the vector, and the second will be the medial. Okay, so again now I need to define a second line which define with the x-axis the plane respect to which the second, the third axis, sorry, will be perpendicular. So I can define another vector that in this case come from the uh, lateral wrist, for example, and the medial elbow. So this is the second line of the forearm. And the first input is the lateral wrist, and the second, the medial elbow. Now I can compute the direction of the Z axis as the cross product between the two, between the X and the second line. This is for um, that axis, axis, where the first input is the X and the second line as the second input. Okay, and so now we are ready to define the third Y axis that is again defined as the cross product between Z and X. So this is the Y for arm axis that will be the cross product between Z and X. Okay, so now we are ready to define also the Fourier reference system. So to create this, we can click on this, select again point and to the unit vector. We can choose as the origin now the midpoint of the wrist. And as the other input, we can choose the X, the Y, and the Z axis. And the name of the output in this case will be the upper for arm reference reference system. And again, I can show you the results. So as you can see, if you look at the reference system we have just created on the um, upper arm, you can see that we have three axes and that the X axis is, we can consider as the, the, the X axis as the um, flexion extension axis of the elbow. We can consider the Z as the 
coronal, the, the axis uh, of the around which we get the abduction abduction movement and we can consider the y axis as the axis where we have internal and external rotation of the of the forearm respect to the upper arm so now we are ready to compute the 3d angle between the two uh, reference system okay so to do that, we can click on the, this operator that is devoted to the creation of a 3D angle. So we can click on it. And now we need to choose the correct sequence for the computation of the angle. And in this case, as it is common in biomechanics, we are going to use the sequence of rotation around the first deflection extension axis, that is the X axis, then around the up abduction axis, that is the Z axis in our example, and then around the Y axis, that is the internal external rotation axis. So I'm going to choose these Euler X, Z, and Y angles, sequence of rotation. Okay, so in this case, the output will be the 3D elbow angles where the first input has to be the, the, the proximal segment and the second, the distal one, so the forearm. So now I can show you the result. So as you can see here, now we have the three different components of the movement in time. So, for example, the first graph, the, the one uh, around the x-axis, is about the flexion extension component. The second, around y, is the internal external rotation. And the third is the abduction-adduction um, component. These variables are um, into the time domain. So as you can see, on the y-axis we have the value of the angle, and on the x we have the time in seconds. In this trial, the subject, let me just show you again the 3D workspace. Okay, so in this, um, in this trial, sorry, in this trial, the subject is performing uh, uh, the same task, so in this case, a flexion extension of the elbow for a series of repetition. And this is typical because to can describe the typical movement, we usually analyze a lot of repetition. And then we compute the average curve between multiple cycles. This is to get more consistency on the pattern. This is the same if we want to get the average results coming from different trial. But remember that we can perform averaging into the time domain but we have to normalize the variables into the time domain. So we have to consider what is the cycle time as the reference time in respect to which perform the time normalization. So to define a cycle, we have to define some time events. And then remember that the cycle is usually defined as the time between two similar events. In this case, for example, We can use, we can use uh, as key event to start the cycle, the instant when the elbow starts to go into extension. So this, so this. And, um, and the end of the cycle will be again the instant when the elbow will stop the first flexion and start for the second extension, and so on. 
So if we look at the 3D elbow angle and we uh, consider the first component, Okay, we can see that we have a minimum on the graph, as you can see here, when, when the elbow starts to go into extension. And then we have a maximum of the angle where the subject, where the elbow has reached the maximum extension. So we can consider a cycle from one minimum to the other minimum. So this will be the first cycle, this is another cycle, and so on. Okay, so now we are ready to define the start event, the start and the stop event for of the elbow extension. To do that, we can click on event and we can choose the option event sequence on 1D object. Okay, in this case, the output is the start extension and yeah, the, the input, I want to choose the first component of the uh, 3D angle. So now I can ask to the application to identify the position of all the minimum points automatically. So as you can see now we have these vertical bars which represents the instance in time when the extension starts. Okay, so as you can see here. Okay. Da, da, da. So now starts to go into extension. And this is the end of the cycle and the game. Okay. Now I can do the same for the other events that I want to identify that is in correspondence of the maximum of the angle. So I can choose again event sequence on one object max extension and again the input I can use as input for this for the definition of this sequence of events the first component so the same component of the 3D angle and now I can ask to the application to look for all the maximum, so about all the peaks and again I can get it automatically defined okay and so this is the results we have for the first sequence and this is the results that we have for the second. Okay, so now uh, we are ready to define a cycle. So now here we have the angle in time. So now we are ready to perform a time normalization respect to the cycle time. To do that, as the output will be again a 3D angle, we can click on 3D angle and then we can enter inside the event operators menu and within here we can select the event defined cycle option. In this case the first, sorry, the output will be 3D uh, elbow angles cycles where the input, the first input is the 3D elbow angles and the second has to be the sequence of events. So in this case the start of the extension event and so this is the results and as you can see here we have now different cards 
related to the different cycles. So, and I want also to sign out that after you have performed a time normalization, you have that um, the, the original time scale in second is converted to a percent of cycle ranging from 0 to 100 of percent. So the 0 percent is when the cycle starts and the 100 percent is when the cycle stops. So in our example, from when the elbow starts to go into extension to when it stops, deflection to go into extension again. The maximum of the graph is when the elbow has reached the maximum extension. So if we want, we can also um, get the percentage in time uh, and we can compute uh, the, this percentage respect uh, to which the maximum extension event happens within the cycle time. To do this, we can click on event, then we can choose event operator and choose the time normalization. In this case, the output will be the max extension percent. Okay, the first input is going to be the sequence of the maximum and the second, the cycle. So, this is the results. Okay. So, as you can see, uh, we have that the, um, the maximum extension happens around the 50% of the cycle. So now we can also do the same with the 1D angle that we have computed on the previous time. So if we want to perform the time normalization of the 1D angle also, we can click on 1D angle, event operator, and then event defined cycle. 1D angle cycles where the first input is the 1D angle and the second is the, the mean time because I want to remember that also in this case we can consider the cycle between the two minimum points so between each minimum so, so again Okay, so again, this is the results. And so, so in this case, you can see that we have the different curves. So now we can continue and we can, for example, compute the maximum values of deflection extension component of the angle in correspondence of each max event, for example. So if we want to do that, we can click on 1D angle we can click on event operator and we can choose the event to define value. The output is the max 3D elbow angle, the X component. And the first input is going to be the first component of the angle. And the, the second input, the sequence, the time sequence of the events, the events. So here we have the sequence of the maximum point of the angle. We can do the same now for the minimum. So I can click on one the angle, event operator, event defined cycle. Now I'm going to get the minimum sequence of, sorry, the minimum value of the 3D angle related to the X component. So again, the input is the 3D elbow angle and now the second input is the, the start, the 
of the extension event. So this is the sequence of the minimum value of the angle. Okay, so now we can compute the, the, the mean value of the maximum and the mean value related to the minimum. To do that, we can click again on 1D angle, we can choose the max mean mean operator, and we can choose the sequence mean option. So mean max 3D angle x, and in this case the input is the sequence of the maximum, and we can do the same for the minimum, so max mean mean operator, and I can choose the sequence mean, and this is the mean of the minimum 3D angle x component. And the input in this case is the sequence of the minimum. So now we have just computed the mean value of the minimum and sorry of the maximum and the mean value of the minimum. Okay, so now we can if we want to compute the, the the range of motion, so we can select again. 1D angle math operator and we can compute the difference between the maximum and the minimum so we can choose this option from the 3D angle X component where the first input can be the maximum the mean value of the maximum and the second the mean value of the minimum and so this is the result. Okay, so now we are ready to compute the average cycle of the trial with its standard deviation and to do this because our output is going to be again a 3D angle we can select this operator and we can choose the option max mean mean operator and we can select the cycle sequence mean okay so in this case the output can be called as the 3d elbow angles mean and the input in this case uh, is the sequence of the normalized cycles and so this is the result. So as you can see we have now the mean value and the standard deviation range. We can do the same also for the other variable that we have computed as the sequence, so for example we can get the mean value of this event, so to compute it we can select the event operator, we can select max mean mean operator and then the normalized sequence mean, so we can have the output as the maximum extension mean and the input in this case is the sequence of events so we can also add this information to the graph okay so as you can see on average the maximum extension happens at around the 50 percent of the entire duration of the cycle Okay, so now we can also compute, for example, the time duration of the cycle. So to do that, that means how many seconds the cycle lasts. So to do that, we can click on the time operator and we can choose the cycle time option. Okay, so the output can be cycle cycles time because this is going to be a sequence 
And in this case, the input has a sequence of the start of the extension event. So this is the result. And if we want, we can now also compute the mean value. To do that, again, we can click on time operator. We can select the maximum mean operator option. And then the sequence mean. So mean cycle time. The input is the sequence of the cycle's time. And this is the result. So, as you can see, on average, the cycle lasts around 1.6 seconds. Okay. So, now I can also compute the average, so the mean value of the 1D angle cycle sequence that was just to remember the sequence of these different graphs. So if we want to get also so the mean value for this, we can select on 1D angle, choose again max mean mean operator, and we can choose the cycle sequence mean again. Mean 1D angle cycle. And the input is the sequence of the normalized graph. And this is the result. So as you can see also in this case, we get the information about the mean value and the standard deviation range. Good. Uh, at last, I would like to show you how you can average more than one trial. In fact, for each operator, there is a specific option devoted to do that. Imagine if, for example, that you want to compute the mean help of 3D angles, but related to more than one trial. So if you want to arrange your protocol in order to can do that in the future, you can, if you want to compute the 3D angle, for example, starting by clicking on the 3D angle operator, then you can choose again the max mean mean operator. And as you can see here, here we have these acquisitions means or mean option. And thanks to this operator, as soon as we will save the protocol and we will load more than one trials, we will get the average value between all of them. So now I'm going to select it. And the output in this case can be the 3D elbow angles average. And the input is the, in this case is the, the mean of the cycle mean. Okay. So now I can do the same also for all the other variables. So, for example, I can get the average value of the cycle time. So, in order to do that, I can click on the time operator. I can choose the max mean mean operator. And then, again, as you can see also, in this, within this operator, the acquisitions mean is an option available. So, I can choose to use it. The Output will be the average cycle time and the input, the mean cycle time. We can do the same also for these events. So I can click on the event operator and if I select, I enter into the menu available within the max mean mean operator again, I have the same option, so the acquisitions mean. So I can use it, okay. And so in this case, the output is the average, average um, max extension, percent. 
and in this case the input as the mean value of the sequence. I can also get the average value of the range of motion coming from more than one trial. So if I want to have it, I can click on 1D angle as the output in this case is an angle, a 1D angle. I can select the mean operator and also in this case, again, we have the same option available, acquisitions mean. So average ROM angle and the input in this case is this and I can do the same for the one we have computed about the um, 1D angle. So again max mean acquisition means um, average ROM 1D This is the input and also for the 1D angle I can do the same. So 1D angle, max mean mean operator and again acquisitions mean. Average 1D angle and the input is the mean value of the 1D angle. Okay, so I can continue, but uh, this is just to show you how you can get um, average results coming from more than one trial. So now that we have just created our first simple 3D uh, kinematic model about these two body segments, now if we want we can extend this model to other tracker trial also. And then, thanks to this acquisitions mean operator, we can get the average results for all because the protocol has now been arranged to manage multiple trials. So now, if I save the protocol, so I can stop too. I can save the protocol. So now if I close it and if I want to load another trial, for example, I can load the already tracked trial one. Okay, so now I have added also this trial to the Smart Analyzer application. And if I want to get the average results coming from both, I can open again our protocol the protocol that we have just created is this one okay and I can now apply the protocol to both the trial so I have to select both and apply and then I can click OK as you can see here when the protocol starts at first you have to define the required events and you have to do the same for all the loaded trials. So, for example, not now I'm going to define the peak time value, but this can be done automatically by the application if you want. So, in this case, I have to define the minimum for the first trial, for the second, the start of the extension, and the maximum of the extension for both the trials. So, now if I look inside both the trial 2 and the trial 1 TDF folder, as you can see that the protocol has automatically computed all the variables we have just created for both. So for example, we can get here the information about the mean 1D angle and also all the other computed variables are within the folder of the TDF file. And as you can, as you have seen you can do it very quickly and if we look at inside the global data folder here we have now the information related to the average value coming from both the loaded trials so for example here we get we have the information of the average value 
coming from both from all the cycles of the trial 2 and all the cycles of the trial 1. So inside the, glob the, the global data contains the results of the um, multiple acquisitions mean operator. Okay, and remember that to average more than one trial is usually recommended to get more consistent data. Okay, so as you can see, you can get the average, you can average in more than one trial very quickly within our Smart Analyzer application. I think that it's very easy to do. So I hope that you have now learned about how to create uh, your own protocol related to 3D kinematics data. And uh, I would like to thank you very much again for your kind attention.